Christian, welcome back. Hey, Stefan. Thank you very much for having me back. Yeah, so it's a crazy world out there, right? As we speak right now, it seems like the uh, UST thing is uh, breaking down as we speak. But nevertheless, development continues and the Lightning Network is growing. And I'm excited to see that. I, I definitely see a lot of cool things happening in the Lightning world. And uh, yeah, wanted to chat to you today about what you're working on with Core Lightning now, not Sea Lightning anymore. And uh, of course, Green Light. And uh, yeah, just kind of what's happening in the space. So uh, yeah, let's start, let's start a little bit with um, the green light stuff because uh, I th as I understand, like from my reading, it seems the idea is, hey, look, it's difficult for people to fully do their own thing. The idea is Blockstream is going to do this as a service to help people make it easier uh, and not have to be as deeply technical into the Linux and the management of the, of the node and things like this. Could you uh, give us your summary? Like what is the... What's the uh, reason behind Greenlight? Absolutely, yeah. So until now, it, uh, it basically has always been the uh, choice when you wanted to join the Lightning Network. You had a choice of either going for a simple custodial wallet uh, that would do everything for you. You didn't have to learn anything, uh, but there is the evil C word in there, right? Custodial. Um, and then on the other side, you had to basically dig through hundreds of tutorials, learn about Linux, learn about how, to, how Bitcoin works. And then on top of that, have to learn about, uh, about Lightning. And uh, we as a community certainly didn't help by basically shaming people into, oh, you have to learn this and this and this and learn multisig before you ever touch Bitcoin, because otherwise you're at risk of losing, losing your funds. And so that had the effect that we got uh, we got many uh, new community members that were really really well informed, but I always always think about the community members that we lost along the way, right? Where we uh, that didn't have the time, didn't have the incentive to to read through all of this this huge pile, and so we thought about how can we improve this, and and green light is basically what uh, what the end result is of that. Uh, we wanted to pull sort of the uh, positive experience of seeing what Lightning could do for you before you had to invest the uh, the time to actually learn about this stuff, become become a self sovereign participant in the network, and basically give you a glimpse of what the payout will uh, will be once you do that. And so, what Greenlight is is basically we looked at a uh, at a Lightning node and thought about how could we split it up. Core Lightning has always been a very modular. A system that has uh, that has had parts that you could swap out and uh, customize for your own needs, um, so that uh, so that it uh, very easily uh, w uh, was a uh, we were able to pull apart and and sort of distribute parts in different different locations. And what we ended up with is uh, Greenlight, a uh, hosted non custodial service, and uh, we think that it is sort of a new point on the spectrum. By basically us running uh, the infrastructure, basically provisioning all of the stuff that that, that you have to do for, to run a Lightning node, including watch showers, including uh, databases, including backups, including authentication, including the Bitcoin backends, and and so on and so forth. And uh, you, as a user, have basically a remote control for that node. And you always have, uh, you are the only one that has access to the signing keys, uh, which are needed to uh, sign off on any changes that touch your funds. Because these really are your funds. We are not managing them for you. You are in full control of, uh, of what happens with these funds. Gotcha. And so in terms yeah. of target user for Greenlight, I'm thinking out loud here that it would be let's say a business who wants to get started with lightning but they don't have somebody who's like a deep in the weeds bitcoin and lightning enthusiast who's going to spend all day every day trying to figure this out uh, and potentially for an interested person who just wants to play around is that mm -hmm. essentially what your target user is here exactly so we do have two target audiences uh in the end we certainly have the uh, inexperienced but uh, but enthusiastic uh, end user uh, in mind that wants to sort of 
he wants ju- uh, they would just want to download a wallet on their phone, get started paying and and receiving uh, lightning payments. And uh, that includes uh, small business owners that sort of are at the beginning of their journey. And uh, on the other hand, we also want to provide a platform for app developers that might be really, really good at what they do best, namely user experience, user interfaces, and and just just building those uh, building those innovative uh, applications. But they might not have the expertise for uh, for Lightning. So we sort of serve these two uh, audiences um, by basically providing a an application programming interface to to uh, application developers. And by providing a node uh, node setup um, in a matter of seconds uh, to to end users, so the user experience should uh, should really be that uh, you go to the app store, you download an app, you get shown twenty four words, and you're done. Uh, basically, in the time it took you to uh, to to open the app, in the meantime, we've spun up your personal Lightning node, which is a Open source core Lightning node, as uh, as you would find it if you installed it yourself, and uh, you can then basically just interact with it and start performing payments, receiving payments, and uh, and doing anything you want. Be that podcasting, or be that, be that just uh, participating in online auctions or uh, tipping people on Twitter. I see. And so for that user, I guess they've got a few different choices in their mind currently, right? They might just use, let's say, uh, uh, like, let's say they go and buy a Raspberry Blitz as an example, and then they do Core Lightning on that. And how would you distinguish that kind of idea of like buying this kind of node in a box and setting it up in your business versus doing a green light setup? So we we definitely encourage anybody to go for the Raspberry Blitz uh, version. Uh, Greenlight is not intended as the final destination for uh, for users. It's a way for uh, for users to onboard, get some education, learn about how this stuff works, and eventually we uh, we'd like to people to actually offboard into their own infrastructure, because that is ultimately the most secure way of uh, of operating on Lightning. Um, there are some trade-offs in, uh, in, in Greenlight. Uh, we do have some visibility that we don't really want. And so eventually we'd, we'd like uh, people to offboard and take on uh, their, own, uh, their own responsibilities. And therefore, that, that also informs our target audience being uh, enthusiastic new users that might not have all of the experiences to actually run a Raspberry Pi uh, with, with Lightning uh, or set up anything else, we are trying to sort of grab market share from the custodians, which we don't think are a, a good option at all, and and sort of get them more on the path towards uh, self sovereignty. I see. And so then, is the idea that somebody might, and maybe this is going to happen as well, is that there may be wallet providers out there who are actually going to use Greenlight in the background? to sort of quickly spin up a node for their users. And I guess that's partly, that, that's maybe from a green light point of view, that's sort of partnering on the business side, but in the background, actually it's green light sort of helping them spin up the nodes that are required for those end users who, who just want the you know, wallet on their phone. Absolutely, that that is uh, that is something that uh, that we are already doing. We announced during Miami, for example, that Breeze is going to migrate over to uh, to Greenlight, and we have a couple of uh, other integration partners that we are currently partnering in a in a closed beta form, uh, and sort of trying to build out a bit of an ecosystem of applications. Uh, the most interesting part here is why is it interesting for application developers is because we don't actually uh, include the node with with the application itself. It means that a user can share a single node among many different applications. And that has a number of advantages for users, but also for app developers. For users, for example, they don't have to split up their funds, right? You don't have to have 50 bucks on a podcasting 2.0 app and 50 bucks on, on, your, on your Lightning wallet. And then as soon as you want to pay 51, you're out of luck. Uh, you can actually pool off all of your funds. You can amortize the management effort that you would put into a single node, um, and and not uh, multiply that by the number of apps. But also for app developers, it's really uh, really interesting because the um, 
because the mode to switch from one app to the other and just sort of try it out for a, for a couple of minutes doesn't mean that you sort of have to tear down a whole different app, move funds over and then reopen channels and all of a sudden the day has finished, right? And you still haven't seen what, what the app can do. And so this is this is general to this remote uh, node uh, setup, but I think that that light uh, that green light can help us sort of popularize this and eventually get uh, get more people into a more efficient uh, deployment of Lightning for each user. I see. And for some users, it might make sense as well if they want to use it more like a remote node, I suppose. Um, and also, there are various aspects that are being done professionally by you know a team who manages it, this as their job. So I guess it's similar to like cloud computing, right? Like people using a cloud service. Well, it's sort of like a cloud node. I guess the other question people would have is, so at least with my understanding of Lightning, when you do like, let's say we have a channel and you know I, I'm either routing a forward um, a payment through to you, or I'm directly the one making the payment to you. So in practice, uh, my node and your node have to both sign the new state of transactions mm -hmm. um, before we can have that transaction completed on the Lightning Network. So how does it work then when the user is still holding their own keys, but the node is in the cloud? Like how does the node, how is the node able to sign an update to the transaction, to the channel? Exactly. So the point here is that basically whenever we have, uh, we have anything that requires a sign off from the keys, be that an on-chain transaction, a connection open there there's a cryptographic handshake involved there um, or or a change in the channel state we need we do need to have a signature from the keys so what we do is we basically take this message that um, that contains all of the information for uh, this request and we send that over to the signer uh, the signer independently verifies that everything is okay and only then signs it and sends it back now as you correctly point out, if the signer isn't there, uh, there's not a whole lot we can do. Um, and that is also why we, uh, why initially we concentrate on the end user experience where routing is not something that, uh, uh, that, that happens, uh, very often. And I, uh, I do believe that, uh, that sort of uh, newbies that that just want to learn about uh, stuff are most likely to be leaves in this in this network of of, uh, of node graphs. So um, it definitely isn't meant for uh, for huge routing nodes because I think they would have the chops to actually run uh, run it on their own infrastructure. Um, so that's that's yet another incentive to sort of once once you want to dip your toes into routing territory, you might you might be better uh, suited for uh, for a self-hosted version. I see. So yeah, so it's seen more like it's training wheels, you know. Like the idea yeah. is you you're on this for a little while, and then eventually you're ready to move out on your own like an adult and uh, take the training wheels off. And so as part of that management for the user, the training wheels. Uh, Things like uh, authentication you mentioned as well. I'd be curious, how does this work from the user's point of view? As I understand, let's say in like a Lightning Labs LND paradigm, they've got the macaroon. And so they, the mm -hmm. idea is you might you might have the macaroon uh, that is the admin macaroon that allows you to then remote control that node. So how does it work in a core Lightning and a green light context in this way? Absolutely, yeah. So, so what we do is uh, we... Uh, uh, we basically implemented the um, the programming interface, the RPC, uh, using gRPC, uh, which is also what uh, what uh, LND uses, by the way. Uh, and uh, underneath that, we use an encrypted transport called uh, called MTLS. So uh, that means uh, that stands for Mutual Transport Layer Security. Um, and the idea here is that uh, both the uh, both the client as well as the node have a certificate, and the certificate uh, is unique for each of these devices. And only if the correct uh, client connects to the right node, we will uh, we will uh, actually enable access. On top of that, we may eventually layer on macaroons to sort of once you have access, restrict uh, individual users, but that is currently uh, not yet built out. Um, but certainly possible. Currently, if you have access to the to the RPC, you have you have full access. Um, that's one dimension of authentication. The other dimension of authentication is well, uh, what what tells us that the uh, that 
what tells the signer that uh, the operation that it is about to sign off actually comes from a user and not not an, an operator or an attacker that might have taken over the uh, the host running the node, right? And so for that we have uh, we have built what we call end to end security, where the uh, where the client whenever he uh, they issue any uh, any command they will sign off on that command and the command will be passed along to the signer and as as context and the signer will then take apart this context see oh uh, so there is a balance change of x in channel y which command does this correspond to and only if uh, if it has a uh, if it has a matching command from a correspond uh, from an authorized uh, client will it sign off on on changes um, so it is very important for us to make sure that uh, that we never ever uh, have control over funds, and even um, and even if our hosts were compromised, then then well, it it wouldn't uh, wouldn't be, uh, affect your funds in any way. Excellent. And so, as an example, um, in the future, then let's say you want to be a merchant and you might want to have different permissions for the employees in the store, in the store as opposed to you, the merchant who's running the node. Um, so maybe that's an example where it might have abilities for you to give permissions that say, okay, only refunds up to this amount, not like being yeah. able to send, you know, just treating everything like it's a hot wallet and they can just spend back all this money. And obviously then there's all this possibility for like embezzlement and so on. So that's, that's exactly one example. Like yeah, like like if you if you have a point of sale that might only be able to create invoices, whereas an oil back office might be able to perform a pay payroll as well as create invoices, and then you might have an accountant that only ha has read only access and and so on and so forth. It's also quite interesting that the signer is basically the perfect place to to have an audit trail um, because it sees every single movement of, of funds. Uh, it has all of the initiators, uh, namely who, who, in, uh, who sent that, uh, RPC command and so on and so forth. So it, uh, it might just be interesting from that point of view to really have a step-by-step, -step, uh, account of what happened to your funds and be able to say, oh, this is, this was initiated by cashier. Uh, a and uh, and then later settled uh, after ten minutes or so. Yeah, and so when we're speaking about the signer here, is that what device is that running on? Like, is that on a phone? Is that on a PC somewhere? Like an always connected PC? Like, what are your thinking? What are your thoughts there on the signer for the typical customer here? Yeah, so the signer is basically just a piece of software at the moment. It, it is uh, it is a library that we bundled with the client itself. So wherever you have your app running, uh, it, it basically is included in the app itself, and it will automatically connect whenever you have the app open. That being said, we can have any number of, uh, of signers for individual nodes. So you might have your, your app on the phone, you might have uh, a Raspberry Pi at home, that sort of the first step towards taking on more ownership that is online 24 hours. And so whenever, uh, whenever your, uh, your app uh, starts the node or we start the node because there is an incoming payment, you, uh, you could have the Raspberry Pi auto connect to your, uh, to your node. Uh, it also suits very nicely for, uh, for Uncle Jim setups or Uncle Bob setups. I can, yeah. can never remember which one it is. Uncle Jim, yeah. Uh, where, uh, where basically you have one, uh, one uh, tech enthusiast that, that sort of digs all of this stuff. And we'll, uh, we can set up signers for, uh, for, their, for their family and closest friends. Uh, so that is, uh, that is how it looks at the moment. Um, but we are collaborating with the Verifying sign uh, Lightning Signer team, uh, Def Random and Ken Sedgwick, um, on, uh, on basically building out the protocol for a, uh, for a Verifying Lightning Signer. This is open source. Their work is, is actually awesome. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the goal uh, in the end there is to make uh, to make it such that we have a signer protocol that we can attach to any uh, Lightning Im implementation, not just Core Lightning, um, and uh, uh, and act as a as a remote signer that uh, that that can then basically take care of your funds. And whether that's hardware uh, or software or on each app, 
it 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 really doesn't doesn't make a, uh, make a lot of difference. Yeah, and I'm curious as well, like in terms of the approach with. So let's say if somebody's doing this and they are presumably like using a phone app to connect back, right? Like using Spark or something similar to connect back mm-hmm. to their green light node. What happens if they go offline at the time? Is it just kind of like the node can still kind of accept a payment because it might have already generated the invoice? And if you're offline, it's no big deal, like like we were saying, because you're more likely to be a leaf node as opposed to like a really deeply well connected uh, node very close to the center of the lightning channel graph if you will yeah the the main issue with uh, with uh, users going offline is basically that we cannot sign off any changes on on funds and that sadly includes where receiving uh, receiving invoices so there's a bit of a trade off uh, we trade uh, we traded off more security for a bit less availability um, but we're uh, we're hoping to uh, to compensate for that by basically enabling users to have multiple signers, to have multiple apps, and reach out to to signers that uh, that might not be online at the moment. So there is a bit of a notification system in the background, where uh, where we plan to hey, there's there's some action going on. There is a signature required from from a signer. Let's try to reach out to anybody who isn't online at the moment and and see if uh, if they could potentially sign off on it. Gotcha. Um, the node themselves. If the signer isn't uh, isn't present, isn't much use uh, because we can't actually do much. Um, so what we do is, after a, a period of in- inactivity, we will shut down that node, and that uh, that is uh, that is basically how we can, uh, besides the high density deployments we can do for Core Lightning, we can save additional resources, and these. Uh, savings uh, are, are then passed on to to, to users uh, once we figure out how to monetize this. Gotcha. And so, just to give people a rough idea, like what kind of cost are they looking at if they want to sign up and have a green light node? So the uh, the cost on our ends uh, are really really low. I'm I'm speaking uh, sub two dollars per month per user. Oh wow. Uh, okay. And, uh, and and so we don't we don't really know how we are uh, we are going to basically pay for it a, a, as of right now. Um, there are a couple of uh, uh, of things we we are looking into, and hopefully we can hide uh, hide that as much as possible from users, such that uh, that it uh, that it really becomes a no brainer to to operate. Right? We'd like to, for example. Um, instead of uh, instead of charging explicitly for uh, for the the nodes, we'd like to charge for uh, for uh, payments being sent and received uh, through the uh, through the built-in fee mechanism in Lightning, and that has the nice side effect that it is basically pay per use. Uh, so you're not using your node, perfect. We you, you don't you don't get charged if uh, if you're a very active user, um, then. Part of uh, of that uh, uh, of your payments is going towards the node itself, and that is basically built into the Lightning protocol itself. We also have a number of, of partnerships with LSPs, uh, whom we are basically providing uh, providing users, uh, and so there, there there are ways we can uh, we can basically agree on uh, with them uh, how uh, if if they want to share some of their revenue with us. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much still in flux. Uh, uh, I can't promise we will manage to make it transparent, but uh, we're definitely trying to. Yeah, interesting. And so uh, in terms of things like managing your uh, watchtower as well, so you mentioned this idea. Mm-hmm. So currently it's probably not that easy to run a watchtower unless you already are a technical user so this might be another aspect of it so what's the um, watchtower setup going to look like here so what uh, what we do is basically we provide a watchtower by default uh, you uh, one uh, if you spin up your node you are automatically re- uh, re- uh, registered with the watchtower uh, we're not charging extra for that so uh, it, it basically is just just uh, a free added service. Um, but once you uh, once you have uh, started digging into Lightning, it might be interesting for you to sort of start using, uh, become more 
uh, involved in some of these processes. And the watchtower is just one of these examples, right? You can, for example, have us run one watchtower for you, um, but you could start by basically taking the watchtower and deploying it on your infrastructure and have a, an additional safety net, right? You, your watchtower could uh, could watch the uh, the channels for you, uh, as well as we watch for uh, watch for uh, for the channels. And so this is this is part of our offboarding strategy, where we have a number of different uh, different services, including the watchtower, including the database backups, including the routing information for uh, for the network that you can selectively sort of start streaming onto your platform and sort of see how things work um, before making the big move of the actual node move, uh, and move that over to, to, your, to your infrastructure. That being said, the inverse is also true. We have a couple of services that we will also offer to, to users that have offboarded. Uh, so for example, we are currently working on a reverse proxy that gives each node a unique uh, URL and that uh, that will then uh, will then be uh, be fixed across uh, across all time. Uh, so if you have your your wallet configured uh, to connect to a certain uh, Lightning node that is at the moment hosted by us, and then you decide to migrate it off onto your own infrastructure, that URL will co will continue to be reachable from outside. And we will forward the, those connections to your node instead of our uh, our hosted see, node. Yeah. And so you don't have to reconfigure your uh, your uh, applications. And all we do is we basically look at the encrypted uh, stream. Uh, there there is a server name indication extension to the TLS protocol, which allows us to say, oh, you want to talk to X Y Z dot Greenlight dot Blockstream.com. Okay, here we'll hand that forward, and all we see is is basically encrypted traffic. We don't see the contents and so on and so forth. Um, and it uh, basically allows you not to have to reconfigure all of your applications uh, just because you uh, you had uh, you, you migrated off of the platform. And that is similar for backups and and watchtowers and so on and so forth. Uh, we plan to offer them uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, right. So the idea is they can sort of gracefully offboard, um, and then so on a backups point of view, as you bring that up, what does that look like? So I mean, there's I guess there's different concepts to understand, right? So they that user will have their seed backup, right? That's their twenty four words, mm -hmm. but then separately there's database backup, and you know, like what what's contained as part of this backup. So the um, the backup we we talk about is uh, is actually just a, a database backup. So we run a, a replicated cluster of Postgres uh, databases on, in the cloud, and we do uh, we basically use those to back all of the nodes of all of the users. Uh, replication is a first barrier of defense, right? If one server goes down, we do have other server, uh, servers to fall back on, and we take uh, uh, we take incremental snapshots of uh, of each change in the database itself, so that we can. Uh, we can recover should everything basically be flooded, um, and then we can take those uh, those incremental backups and, can, and we can stream them to the client. So in that sense, even uh, even if from from today to tomorrow we were to disappear completely, you could take this backup, uh, rehydrate it, and import it into your uh, your database, and you'd basically have a functioning node again. Yeah, and so. The other thing people are having to learn if they want to be a self-sovereign Lightning user is channel management. So who do I open channels with? How do I rebalance them when they go out of whack? Uh, do I need to use on-chain and off-chain swapping? Like if, let's say, mm -hmm. I've got all the, the, the sats on my side of the channel, I need to sweep it out. How does that work in a green light context? So that is definitely part of uh, of the promise here that uh, that we want to assist as much as possible with uh, with this kind of management, and we want to make it as as easy for users to to start as uh, as possible. And for this, we have uh, we have a number of agreements with uh, liquidity providers um, that uh, that participate in uh, in a system with us um, that is still being built. Uh, so uh, not not everything is set in stone at the moment. 
Um, but the idea is basically that if a wallet notices that, oh, I'm creating an invoice, but I don't have any incoming liquidity, um, I need an incoming channel, then we can we can reach out to these LSPs, sort of figure out what the best uh, what the best capacity for them is, and then send back those proposals to the app themselves. And then the app uh, can uh, can say something like, "Oh, um, you don't have you're not well connected enough. Would you like us to to do that for you?" And uh, and if the user clicks yes, we can basically pick one of these one of these proposed channels. We can stage it with the liquidity provider, and once the payment comes in, only then we will go through the motions of actually opening the channel, transferring the payment, and uh, uh, sending back the payment for the liquidity provider. Um, so it should be really low touch, but like I said, it's uh, probably the, the problem. Uh, the difficulties are usually in the details here. Of course, right, and it, it does remind me a little bit of this. Uh like Phoenix on the fly channel creation, but yeah. maybe arguably in a more decentralized ish kind of way, or at least with multiple possible liquidity providers. Whereas in the context of, let's say a user who's receiving on Phoenix, your channel is coming from async and only async. So I guess that's one difference there. Exactly. Yeah. We're, we're also looking into, uh, uh, into how we could use dual funding, uh, which Core Lightning pioneered and liquidity ads, of course. Uh, which are pretty much uh, the first half of the of the uh, of the uh, whole construction, right? We we know who is willing to open what channels for what price, um, and now we just need to make sure that we can actually open it with the zero confirmations. Uh, that that the uh, LSP knows how to wake us up if the node is uh, currently offline, and uh, and all of these smaller details. Um, but we're uh, we're looking very much for a uh, for a uh, protocol uh, level solution first. I see. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting to see. And so with well, dual funded channels or collaborative channel openings, that's uh, really cool as well because then we're having a scenario where both partners of that channel are putting up some money into that channel, and so. It just becomes like well, I guess the main one benefit is obviously the channel starts out with with um, the possibility to send either way. It's not just like I open the channel to you and I can only spend to you. I can actually receive from you as well. Yeah. And the other part is maybe a little bit of a privacy benefit in that on chain, it's not as clear who's put what into where, and so that might also help from a a little bit from a privacy point of view. Exactly. Not not just that, but also you have a very much reduced online uh, on chain footprint, uh, which yeah. means you are saving on fees. Um, you uh, you are uh, you have less data to track. You don't uh, you don't have uh, that that much of a footprint overall, and so it uh, it definitely makes it harder for for an outside observer to see. Oh, um, so who added which funds to this channel. So it, it is basically a coin join uh, to create a, a channel. Yeah, so maybe it's like a like a pay join, right? Like we both contribute yeah. into uh, that. And so from a liquidity ads point of view, is that something being managed at the green light node level or is like the user being able to do that themselves? How does that part work? So generally speaking, we do, uh, we do expose um, the entire uh, RPC interface from from uh, Core Lightning. So, uh, if you have some uh, something that currently uses the Core Lightning API, you can uh, you can just adapt it to use uh, to use the Greenlight um, Node API, um, and that includes stuff like uh, uh, like adding uh, adding liquidity ads or listing liquidity ads, and uh, then opening channels. Um, we definitely do encourage users to get familiar with the with the API itself, and so we also don't put any limits as to whom whom you are allowed to open channels to. So you could basically just just do it manually. Um, it it is after all just a core Lightning node in the cloud. I see. Yeah. So I mean, you could just yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like you could SSH in and just literally do it all command line if you wanted to. But the idea is this is like making it easy for people who maybe are not at that level. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and so turning to, I guess, Core Lightning as well, I see, uh, you know, the new version 
version 0.11 uh, has um, the, I saw one I saw is uh, you've now got the ability to have multiple live channels to the same peer. Now this is kind of an interesting difference in some of the implementations because before it was like, oh, people could do multiple ones with other implementations, but with C Lightning back then, it was seen like, no, just one channel. And now I guess yep. it's kind of seen like, well, okay, this is where people are going. We're just going to have to support this now. Is that basically what happened? Exactly. Yeah. We, for the longest time, we had a bit of an ideological um, stance against uh, having multiple channels with a single peer, uh, because if you, uh, if you open two channels to the same peer, um, then you're not increasing your, uh, your resilience against uh, single points of failure. Uh, whereas if you, if you were to use that second channel to open to somebody else, uh, you could, uh, you, you could basically increase your resilience uh, and reduce your uh, your risk of uh, basically that one golden uh, peer going down and you being cut off from the network. Um, and uh, it has been it has been a feature that has been uh, long requested. Uh, we still maintain that it is probably better to have a diverse set of uh, of peers right. and then do indirect routing to actually reach your destination instead of basically just opening a channel directly to starbucks and then doubling down on that every time that your that, uh, that your channel is exhausted um but uh yeah it, it has been requested and uh, there are some scenarios especially for large uh, nodes that uh, that sort of have built this backbone in the network uh for uh, with with huge channels um for for them it, it was really important to have this uh, ability to increase capacity uh, on a whim and uh, we always wanted that to be splicing um, where you could basically add or remove funds from an existing channel without any downtime um, but uh, it, it just took a bit longer to to build out splicing um, we now have one engineer working on it and he's making a lot of progress and i'm really looking forward to after six years of talking about splicing, actually seeing it in action. Um, but uh, yeah, the basically multiplexing channels has, has been a feature that, that we just needed to support after all. Gotcha. And yeah. Rusty has done a, an amazing job at refactoring all of the stuff and making it possible uh, in, the last, in, in the last release. So kudos Excellent. to him. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm excited to see splicing as well because I think that would make it a lot more practical to... So, I mean, right now people are using, let's say, swapping in and out to sort of manage the the currently the current size of that channel. But if you actually wanted to make it bigger or make it smaller, that's where a splice could really be a cool feature to have because then you're not having to close it down, reopen the channel. It's yeah. just one on-chain transaction to, I guess, resize that channel so I, I guess but it's one of those things where we can talk about that idea but actually in practice achieving that is maybe not as easy to do as what we're talking about there are a lot of details in that but i mean even more exciting than than uh, than adjusting the size of a channel which okay you might do every once in a while is the fact that all of a sudden you can uh, you can perform on-chain payments out of uh, of a channel gotcha um which uh, which gives you this this ability to basically have an app that is pure lightning. Uh, it shows you one balance. Hey, this is how much you uh, you you currently own, and then you scan a, an on chain Bitcoin address uh, and and send uh, send a payment to it. And what happens in the background is basically it takes all of the funds that uh, that you had uh, in a channel. It quickly closes it splices out some funds to that address and then reopens it without any downtime yeah um, and so that that is a huge mental barrier at the moment uh, that that people have to overcome oh i have an on-chain balance i have an off-chain balance uh and then what do you do if if the off-chain balance isn't sufficient anymore do you open a channel now oh you have to wait an hour for that to happen um and so I think just from a usability point of view, splicing is an amazing feature. Yeah, that's clever. Yeah. And I think it's like there's different approaches in the ecosystem right now, right? Like like with Phoenix, as an example, if you use that, it's really you're paying out to an on-chain address. It's like using a swap provider in the background. Or with Moon, yeah. it's sort of kind of like a splice, but kind of it's slightly different. And so, yeah, it would be really cool to see like genuine splicing coming into 
lightning. So uh, yeah, I'm excited for that. Um, I think that's cool. And, yeah, go on. And it and it's less trust uh, trusted than than a swap because yeah. if you want to uh, if you do a swap onto uh, onto an on chain address that doesn't have the ability of actually transporting an HTLC, then what you're basically doing is giving the swap provider, hey, here's here's a payment. And the swap provider says, okay, I promise I'll turn around and send that on chain yeah. uh, because we don't have uh, we don't have a tool to send to a generic address in a secure uh, uh, in a secure way that uh, is atomic, right? Um, yeah, right. So, yeah, that yeah, is, that makes that a lot is of the sense. main issue there. Yeah, and I, it depends. Obviously, it's so many things. There's so many moving parts and variables here, but it could end up being cheaper too, right? Because if you're just splicing right. out. You might not have to pay a service provider who's giving you this swap in and out functionality. Now, of course, we may still need swap providers in the Lightning network, just as we need LSPs, Lightning service providers, in the network. But in this specific example, the splice out may be cheaper, hypothetically. Well, the, the swap provider does also have an advantage in that he can uh, aggregate a lot of swaps into gotcha. the, uh, into a single address. So it probably depends on how much traffic there is on the swap and how long you're willing to wait for this aggregation to happen. Yeah. Uh, because if there is a payment that comes in every hour and the swap provider waits for 10 of them to accumulate, gotcha. you're probably waiting for 10. Um Gotcha. So, so sort there, of like there's a batch, probably a balance batch there. transaction, right? So, so if they can do it like a batch transaction, it's kind of the similar dynamic of, you know, exchanges. Instead of just doing exchange withdrawal one to one each time, they can do like one batch transaction out to like ten people or fifty people at once. So exactly, big saving there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. And so, just in terms of the. Oh, one other thing uh, around making Lightning ubiquitous, right? So I know there are obviously there are different standards in play at the time at different times. One idea I've seen from Miles Suter of Cash App is this idea of BIP21, and so it's like this idea of having. And apparently, it's quite an old standard, but like the idea is they're sort of doing it in reverse. They've got like a Lightning payment and an encoded Bitcoin address in there, and his idea is that hey, what if everyone uses BIP21 to try to, you know, make it more and more in the background so the the end user like obviously if you're a hardcore bitcoin and lightning guy you know you love it you're you're fine with that but the end like the average retail end user who doesn't really understand like the difference of bitcoin and lightning maybe there's something there but i'm curious what are your thoughts on that do you see it like there are other standards out there we're, we're not settled on this yet do you have any thoughts on uh making that user experience very seamless so it, it's it's definitely something that uh, that we have been thinking about for a long time, especially since Bolt eleven includes an uh, an on chain fallback address. Um, but uh, from experience, we found that uh, that sort of the behavior of uh, on chain payments and off chain payments are so different that you certainly don't want to have an automatic fail, uh, fallback. Gotcha. Um, so while I, while I do agree that. At having an alternative way of uh, of paying for a, a transaction, be that on chain or off chain, and Bolt Eleven obviously uses uh, uses the uh, Lightning payment as default and on chain as as fallback, and BIP twenty one uses on chain as default and could use other methods as as fallbacks. Um, I do think that uh, that we need to be very careful about when do we offer a, a fallback at all. For example, if I'm standing in front of a, po a point of sale and all I bought is a chewing gum, then I don't want to be surprised because now I have to wait half an hour for an on-chain transaction to right. confirm. Yeah. Um, and because once once we initiated that payment, there's no turning back. Uh, we we can't we can't really abort uh, in in mid session, um, and so. That is uh, that is something to be aware of, but I totally agree that uh, that providing uh, a full matrix of different payment options is is definitely desirable, uh, so that users can pick and choose what whatever works for them. And if none works, well, we're falling back to what we already had, right? The for, the the single payment didn't work, so yeah, it's it's not worse. Yeah, and it, it does get challenging because of having to deal with different scenarios, right? So as you said, if it's a chewing gum, maybe it's a dollar for that chewing gum. You're not really going to pay 
a dollar or even 50 cents on-chain transaction fee for that. So maybe in certain cases, it would have to be restricted to say, no, Lightning only. We don't want to do any on-chain below a certain value. But then above a certain value, it might be like, no, on-chain only, right? So it's like the other way. Yep. So there's, there's different ways that it could end up going. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. For, for for this kind of trade off, we we have we have introduced uh, the idea of a fee budget in in Core Lightning, um, and uh, what we do is basically we compute zero point five percent of the of the uh, tra- amount to be transferred. Uh, we allocate to to a fee budget, and inside of that fee budget, we do a number of optimizations. Um, that uh, some go towards improving payment efficiency. Uh, we're looking into uh, into Picard payments, for example. Those might not end up being the cheapest ones, but the ones that that have the highest success rate. And we also use uh, some of that fee budget to uh, to obfuscate uh, payments, for example, to add shadow routes uh, to sort of fuzz the fees at at various points in in the payment. And the idea behind that is uh, is obviously that uh, there should be there should be a percentage below which the user really doesn't care. There's other stuff that is more important, like their time to completion. Um, and uh, a similar concept could be introduced for the fallback on-chain uh, payments as well, uh, where you say, "Hey, uh, all I'm interested in is speed of completion or uh, low fees." Uh, but I, I don't care about the exact fees. They don't have to be optimal or minimal in uh, in, in that sense. Um, I, I have a certain experience that I'm looking for, and and please provide me with that payment experience. Yeah, yeah, that's cool to see. Um, I am hopeful. Like I think one interesting stat, and like I think part of it comes to education as well. Um, because uh, there was an interesting stat, actually. I saw Matt Alborg from BitRefill pointed out, like he, was, I think he was looking through some data and seeing that out of all the Cash App customers of BitRefill, as in people with the Cash App mm-hmm. paying a BitRefill, that apparently, even though Cash App can do Lightning payouts, only one third of the users were using Lightning So for that. So I don't know exactly mm. what happened, but maybe it's like they don't know which button to press on BitRefill, like at, just as an example, right? And if it's already at that point where, let's say, all these users could be using Lightning and just massively faster, smoother experience, lower fees, uh, you know, it's an educational um, thing, but also maybe a technological thing as well that as a community, uh, you know, as the ecosystem of businesses, developers and like advocates have to uh, think about that, right? Yeah, it's it's definitely a chicken and egg problem, right? Uh, for uh, for vendors to to show Lightning prominently, there needs to be a sufficiently large user base, and for there to be a sufficiently large user base, there has to be enough awareness that well, this uh, this seller actually accepts Lightning too. So, um, I, I think we'll eventually get uh, get that breakthrough, uh, and I see awareness of of Lightning payments and their advantages but also their disadvantages growing over time yeah so i wanted to chat a little bit about any prev out as well Mm -hmm. um just to you know get an update from your thoughts i mean last time we spoke uh, it was was a while ago on this uh you know about any prev out could you give us a a bit of your updated thoughts on where any prev out is at in terms of you know development and thinking yeah, so um, it it wouldn't be an episode with me without chilling L two at least once, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, for for us to get L two, we need something that uh, that that uh, provides us with the base functionality. And any prev out is exactly that base functionality, or is one way to achieve that base functionality. Um, at the moment, the uh, the proposal itself is uh, is quite well reviewed uh, it's uh, uh, it has uh, it has been uh, merged since uh, since AJ towns uh, uh, re- uh, ported it over to taproot which is also when the uh, when the name change uh, from say cash no input which was my original draft uh, changed to uh, any prev out uh, or any prev out any script uh, which is a much better name, by the way. Um, Cash no input really was confusing, um, and uh, so the specification is pretty much settled. Um, there are some uh, experimental implementations of it uh, in branches, both by AJ and uh, Richard Myers, 
and uh, Richard Myers has built out a uh, working example of how L2 could be built on uh, on this branch. Um, so we are seeing uh, we are seeing that uh, any prevout is uh, actually fulfills its promise of enabling L2. Um, I was pretty sure about that, but it's always nice to to have confirmation of that. Um, and uh, we are basically uh, looking into different uh, different uh, ways to make use of any prevout beyond L2. Um, so technically speaking, if any prevout were merged, we could have the base uh, uh, base L2 system working onto which then different uh, different enhancements and improvements are stacked on top. Um, but as it is, any prevout would give us that. Um, and ever since uh, Jeremy came out with uh, OpsyTV, uh, we've also been looking into into his uh, uh, his use cases and see how they interact with any prevout. And some of them uh, are uh, interesting enough. We can uh, we can build out some of uh, some of these use cases using OpsyTV. Um, so that's that's something that i didn't expect but uh, but for example we can uh, we can reconstruct some form of covenants uh using uh, using any prevout and uh the non recursive ones uh, the non controversial ones i should say and um and uh we can also build a form of congestion control which is something that jeremy has uh, has proposed so there is a bit of overlap between the two uh, sadly, though, OpCTV alone doesn't enable L2. Uh, for that, we would need another change called OpCheckSig from Stack, uh, which, if I remember correctly, is a bit more controversial. Um, but hey, if if we if we can get uh, if we can get the functionality we need for L2, I don't care if it's called APO or CTV plus CSFS. Um, so uh, as long as as we get uh, we get what we need to make progress here. I see. Yeah. Um, and also, as I understand, there's been more discussion on the mailing list and things. And I think even the last episode, we spoke a little bit about it. But if you could help us explain and understand, like help us understand a little bit about some of these ideas, like like a pinning attack and mm-hmm. um, layered commitments. Well, let's start with pinning attacks. So if you could just help us understand what is a pinning attack in, and what's the, I guess, the significance of this in an L2 context? Yeah, uh, so pinning attacks were something that uh, that we found in uh, while developing anchor outputs for for Lightning, um, and the idea is basically that uh, that if we have some malleability in the uh, in the transactions, namely that uh, if the two of us, for example, manage a channel together then they are first party malleable in that i can uh, i can change some parts of uh, of this of this transaction uh, and you can change some parts of this transaction and anchor outputs increases that malleability so that you can have a child transaction attached to uh, to one of the outputs and if you then take this uh, 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 take this bundle of the closing uh, transaction for the channel plus the uh, plus the uh, child that is paying for for fees, and make that child really big, you end up with a bundle that has a, a gigantic fee, uh, but a very low fee rate. Um, so um, it might be ten kilobytes, and it might have ten kilosatoshis attached to it. Uh, so one v byte per byte. Um, but the overall fee is ten kilo uh, kilo uh, sats, so uh, so that would position that transaction very low in the mempool uh, itself. So it would be very unlikely for, for a miner to pick it up and and include it in a block. But nevertheless, it it is sort of tainting the mempool uh, in that if uh, if you perform this attack and I wanted to sort of fee bump my uh, my version of that transaction. Whoever sees uh, first your transaction and then my transaction would basically say to my transaction, "Oh, you don't have enough uh, sufficient, uh, sufficiently large overall fees. Maybe despite my transaction paying twice the fee rate, right? Uh, simply because for us to make a replacement, both the absolute fee and the fee rate has to be uh, has to be um, 
uh, uh, beaten basically. Um, and then people were, uh, were, were sort of, uh, take, picking up my chant of, of, of saying, ah, L2 fixes this. And one voice was missing and that was mine because I then had to turn around and say, nope, this is also true for L2. Um, so that, that was indeed a sad day. Uh, the, the good news here is that we, uh, we have a very large number of, uh, of ideas on how we can fix it. The problem with many ideas is also that uh, there is a lot of competition as always. Um, so uh, whose idea is, is the best and uh, what, uh, what are the downsides of each individual uh, idea? So um, there are, for example, uh, people who are proposing that, uh, that in, uh, we should sort of separate the mempool replacement logic into different different concerns because that fee rate bump is what miners really care about, right? Uh, if I have a transaction that pays me more fees for the same number of bytes, hey, I'll take the one with, with more fees, right? Uh, whereas the absolute fee, uh, fee uh, rule is more of a denial of service uh, protection uh, where, uh, where we could have an attack of somebody creating a huge transaction which with tiny fees, but just enough to be relayed on the network. And then once uh, uh, the next second they shave off one byte, therefore they have a higher fee rate in absolute terms and they could send it through again. Uh, and that that is basically prevented by requiring an, a bigger overall fee. Um, and the idea is, uh, and, and one of the ideas is basically to say, hey, instead of looking into the fees to decide on replacements, we could rate limit what, uh, what peers can send us. Um, so... You, uh, you're my peer, uh, you just sent me uh, 10 kilobytes of transactions. Now I will accept the next transaction from you uh, only after a certain uh, certain period of the cooldown period, basically. Um, but as always, the discussions here are a bit, a bit more complex right. and uh, lengthy. <laughs> Yeah, and what happens is, is, at least from what I can notice on things like mailing list discussion and online discussion is sometimes if there's not one clear winner, then people just spend all day, you know, just constantly arguing about this and that and there's not really like a clear kind of this is the path forward and then sometimes things happen, sort of fall into a gridlock, uh, unfortunately, in some cases. It, it has to be said, though, that this is part of the process. Uh, it is very important for us to basically have this time to stew over different ideas and sort of uh, think about all of the different things that might be impacted by one uh, proposal uh, or the other. And so I, uh, I think this, this sort of lengthy discussion and lengthy process to, to actually reach a conclusion is, is a feature in this case. Uh, this is this is not a system that that we want to change willy nilly. This is something that that we want to keep for the next hundred, two hundred years, up and running. So, um, what what's an additional year uh, compared to centuries of of uptime? Yeah, yeah. And so, what's this uh, layered commitment idea? So the layered uh, commitment idea is uh, is came uh, is something that AJ Towns came up. A uh, very pro a prolific researcher, um, and uh, the idea is that uh, we can cut down the waiting times for L2 uh, in the worst case uh, a bit. Uh, basically, the way that the uh, that the transactions are structured in uh, in L2 is that the um, the we have an update transaction which sort of ratchets us forward. Uh, in the states, and then based off of that uh, update transaction, we have a settlement transaction which actually has the desired effects in the end. Right, that there's an output for me, there's an output for you, and there might be an HTLC attached to it. Now, closing a transaction now incurs this this two phase close. Right, we first send uh, settle uh, settle the channel itself by sending update plus settlement transaction. And only then we get to settle whatever is built on top of it. For example, an HTLC. I see. And all of this includes timeouts in it, right? So like uh, like two hours of waiting time, six hours of waiting time, and so on and so forth. Um, and that has the slightly negative effect of uh, uh, of 
the timeouts of the settlement transaction and the HTLC summing up to a longer timeout. And what uh, what layered commitments does it takes the uh, it takes some of the time critical uh, uh, structures and moves them not on the settlement transaction but moves them on the update transaction. So as soon as the update transaction is sent to the network, we can already start ticking down the timers for HTLCs. Um, there's a couple of pros and cons. The pro, of course, is uh, shorter timeouts. Um, Timeouts as in your funds are not available for six hours um, until we have we have asked the blockchain judge to sort of decide, hey, you misbehaved or you misbehaved. And on the uh, on the con side is that it is a, a much more complex uh, structure um, that that loses some of what uh, what was attractive to, uh, in in L two, namely the simplicity and the cleanly uh, cleanliness of of separation between concerns, because you're now moving the HTLC back into the update mechanism itself, which is one thing that I tried my hardest uh, to to avoid in in L two, um, but yeah, it's it's an open discussion and and we will we will sort of reach a conclusion eventually, I guess. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, and because, yeah, like you were saying, there's various uh, positives about that L2 aspect, right? It makes watchtowers much cheaper and easier to operate. It makes a whole bunch of other things um, easier. So uh, remains to be seen what happens there. And I think one other critique I've seen online is this idea that, oh, because L2 is changing the penalty model. Uh, so mm -hmm. whereas currently in Lightning, there's this penalty model that if, let's say, I'm a bad guy, I try to cheat you, you're, you know, you're... Uh, penalty close you can like steal you can like take those funds back from me or more than i lose i have an incentive to not to be honest right and so there's this argument yep. of oh in l2 land you know anyone can just try it because all uh at the worst the other guy can only just publish the the correct state and you don't have any you don't have like this sort of incentive or this negative incentive that you're not going to lose money um but then <coughs> i've seen discussion on this idea that oh you know, could they try to re-implement like a penalty model in the L2 sense or would it be just more seen like, you know, keep the simplicity of L2? Yeah, so uh, usually my my uh, answer to, to the lack of penalties in, in L2 is that there is a small penalty uh, in the form of, of the uh, transaction fee that you use to basically try to cheat. Um, well, that might not uh, not be as harsh as losing the entirety of your funds. Uh, it, it is it is still a paper cut, um, and uh, if at the same time we can we can reduce the chances of you succeeding by making watchtowers much much more uh, feasible and much cheaper to operate, um, then we've basically achieved the same effect after all. Yeah, uh, ri risk is always the uh, the. Uh, the multiplication of uh, the chances of something bad happening, in this case, you successfully cheating, which we re reduce by, uh, by uh, uh, basically improving watchtowers, times the, uh, times the, uh, the cost of, uh, of actually succeeding, uh, uh, of, of this ev event actually occurring. And in this case, uh, by, by making it uh, so, so we've reduced the cost, but we've increased the chances of you being caught. And in the end, that uh, that can cancel out. Um, as for additional penalty mechanisms built on top of uh, of L two, I think that is definitely a possibility. Uh, but it would reintroduce some of the complexity that we try to eliminate with L two yeah. again, namely sort of the asymmetry the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 reintroducing a symmetry, which then makes makes it really hard again for for multi-party channels. Uh, simply because if we have out of a set of n users, we have to be able to pinpoint who misbehaved out of this and then sort of distribute the penalty among the participants. It's not as clear cut as it was in a two party channel where uh, you cheated, I get your funds. With n parties, uh, it, it becomes mu very much more difficult to to discern. Yeah, right. And I think, yeah, I think the simpler l2 model is probably what i would what i would rather see personally um because at the end of the day as you were saying part of this is about scalability as well right taking lightning to the world and 
we we all know that current lightning does not scale non-custodially to the world, right? Like this is just a, everyone understands this. And so it's about what's the best way to make that more feasible. And I, I think that's probably the point to understand is that if we could get into this multi-party channel world, it actually makes it easier for more people to self-custody, which arguably strengthens the system. Um, but yeah. I, I also understand that, you know, there's there's big arguments as well. And, you know, some of that is fair enough because some people could say, look, just no more changes to Bitcoin, right? There's the, uh, let's say the Bitcoin the Bitcoin conservatives uh, or the, the ossification crowd, right? This kind of never change anything, like maintenance updates only, no changes, right? And I can understand that view too. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that... Uh, uh, we we can get the right kind of technology in that helps, but at the same time, there, every change has a risk. So yeah, I'm curious yeah. what your thoughts are on the the whole ossification crowd. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've I've followed the Bitcoin project for the last 13 years, and and I've seen it going from a very experimental thing where Satoshi one night just pushes some code and everybody just deploys it to this uh, to this more rigorous approach of uh, of proposals arguments. Uh, followed by reviews, followed by implementations, followed by tests, followed by deployment, um, and I think it's it's only natural that that for a system that that ha- uh, that has gained this importance in our daily lives, uh, we should be very cautious about what changes go in and what uh, what don't. Um, and most importantly of uh, of all of this is probably that uh, that the process has to be slow on purpose we cannot rush any of this and we do have to give all of the uh, all of the proposals the, the sufficient time to stew to get that feedback to get people excited about it uh, to get people experimenting with it and uh, and maybe out of this discussion then then we find out a a much cleaner much nicer way of doing uh, doing things um for example, my uh, the the any prevout uh, proposal, uh, I would be I would be absolutely thrilled if if that were to uh, uh, to to be to be merged. But if something else comes along that gives us the necess- uh, necessary functionality and that might be even more efficient than than any prevout, it's a small hit on my ego, but it's a huge step for uh, for the ecosystem as a whole because we then can get uh, get uh, get what we wanted to do uh, from from the get go, but in a better uh, and uh, and more efficient way. I haven't seen this proposal yet, but uh, but maybe it will come up, and uh, hence also my my approach when uh, when proposing uh, any prev out, I, I wanted to have a very hands off approach. Uh, and instead of trying to push any prev out, I wanted to get uh, to get people excited about the possibilities of what we what we build on top of it, uh, simply because the uh, the functionality we can get can maybe get in multiple different ways, and we shouldn't we shouldn't concentrate on on the name on the tin so to speak. Yeah, yeah, interesting stuff, and we I, I, we'll have to see. Hopefully, uh, there'll be um, some discussion there. I think uh, I've heard I heard an interesting characterization uh, the other day. Uh, Shinobi was on um, with Citadel Dispatch, on with Rusty and with Matt O'Dell, and he was characterizing it like it's it's like this anarchic mob. And if you want to change, you need to convince the anarchic mob they should take your change, right? Like at the end of the day, like I mean, it's a bit kind of oversimplifying in certain things, but hey, it, it kind of is true, right? Like if the users and the developers and the miners all want this. It's going to happen, but I think what we see is maybe there's this discussion, and it's difficult for the same person who puts it out there to be kind of the only promoter of it. That there needs to be enough other people who also really want this thing, and they're willing to push for it. And so uh, maybe that's what has to happen with any prev out, right? If if people want it, then there needs to be enough people out there saying, "Yeah, I want I want this thing because I want L two or or." Even if it's not any prevout and something else that gives us a similar um, scaling uh, functionality or technology. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's 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 what we want to get in the end, and not how we uh, how we get it that is important, uh, I think. And and so, it is much much better to create excitement about uh, about applications, about use cases, rather than the how we do it. Um, 
we as engineers usually get very hung up on on how we do it and and the technical trade-offs but as a, end users it, it is much more uh, uh much more practical for for users to imagine what the what the uh what the thing that we enable by it uh, is rather than the technical trade-offs uh, that, that are required for, for actual sanity review in this case. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with the anarchic mob that that's a, that's a very good picture. Um, and yeah, let's, let's give people the time to actually make up their mind because there might be somebody asleep in that anarchic mob. And, and when they wake up, they might bring the new, uh, the new solution to the table. Yeah, well, let's see. Hey, so uh, so let's uh, wrap up the episode then. So we spoke a little bit about Greenlight, this idea for, you can think of it like a training wheels for your core lightning node. And the idea is you're a business, you're an interested, enthusiastic user, you can use it. Uh, and we spoke a little bit about, you know, the lightning network as well as uh, any out as well. So um, do you have any closing thoughts for the listeners and uh, where can people find you online? So I'm uh, Snyke on Twitter, uh, S-N-Y-K-E, and uh, C. Decker almost everywhere else. Uh, and I'm always happy to talk about uh, about tech and uh, and some uh, funny things uh, about uh, about Bitcoin and Lightning. Um, I also like just talking about Lightning in general, to be honest. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to 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 seeing where where Greenlight gets us. Um, we hope that that it builds uh, it builds a solid foundation for us uh, to for app developers to build on, for users that just want to build uh, build out a, a prototype at hackathons, and of course serve as an uh, on ramp for self sovereign uh, for eventually self sovereign uh, Bitcoiners uh, to learn uh, the ropes and 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 get uh, get the expertise they need to move around in this world. Excellent. Well, thanks again for joining me. Thank you so much.